as well as you know, they're still on the road. Uh, the funeral for Joe Vigil uh, this Tuesday. And, uh, the plan is that the pastor will preach at Grayside after the funeral on Tuesday. It's for Sessie, Colorado, as you know. It takes time to get back. But, uh, but anyway, please do be praying for uh, that family as well. Uh, Joe's wife, uh, Jeanette, not only survives him, but they also have four children, uh, Heather, Vanessa, Chantel, and Jeremiah. Okay, so please be in prayer about them. Now this evening, we'll take up your individual prayer request, but if you have a uh, particular unspoken request, uh, you could signal that by the raising of your hand as well. Praise God. Praise God. Well, if you'll stand, we'll go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for being with us today.
And that story with Joseph, you know, he is he he does die, obviously. He's 110 years old when he dies. Uh, you know, he has the title of Joseph of Ramathaim, yes, right. which is a, a Hebrew word, if you will, for statement. Uh, it means Joseph of a high place. And uh, so uh, about 400 years later, after the Jews are in Egypt, actually it's the 400th year, they go to the promised land. Of course, they take the bones of Joseph with them, right? And uh, But 400 years later, with the story of Moses, um, you know, with Moses, it's like, well, he's telling the Pharaoh, let us go worship the Lord for three days in the desert. It's really all about that. Of course, God has a different plan, and Moses knows that, but the people probably don't. Uh, but at any rate, when they finally it works out to where uh, when the Jews do leave, later the Pharaoh, the evil Pharaoh and his army, they're going to attack the right. Jews to annihilate them. They're going to try to kill all of them, all, kill all the Jews on the planet Earth, if you will. And of course, uh, God has a different plan with that, right? But you have to ask that question, why would the Pharaoh want to go destroy him when he thinks originally they're going to be gone for three days and they're going to come back? You do have to ask that question. And, and the answer to that is when the Pharaoh sees that the tomb of Joseph is empty, right. he knows the people are going to be liberated. Okay, so fast forward 1,500 years after Moses, we had Jesus in the tomb. Right. And he's in Joseph's tomb. And remember the name of the man as soon as he buried him? Yeah. And when you transliterate Joseph of Ramathaim 1,500 years earlier, or actually 1,900 years earlier, which is in Egypt, to the Greek, to your English, you get Joseph of Arimathea. And if you compare Pharaoh with Satan, when Satan sees that the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea is empty, he knows you're going to be liberated. Right. And your children are going to bring children. Now, the last thing I'll say before I turn the service over to uh, Sister Lynn and so forth uh, is that important? Well, I, I believe there's a message in all of that, okay? And when you look at the story of Joseph in Egypt, he has a father. And what's his father's name? Jacob, right? We all know him as Jacob and the twelve sons of him. But what's the father of Joseph the carpenter's name? Oops. So when you go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 13, the father of Joseph the carpenter, his name is Jacob also. See the connection with the Holy Spirit, and uh, that's a great story. Yeah, I'll yeah. share that with you. Well, I turn the service over to Sister Carolyn and Sister Linda.
this time I'm going to be taking up my tithes and offerings. Ignorance. 
In the book, book of Acts chapter 17, the Bible tells us when Paul was in the city of Athens, and, and, and it tells us that the whole city was given up to idolatry. Those people were very, were very ignorant, and Paul spoke to the crowd, right. yes. and he said while he was preaching to the crowd, in, in Acts 17, 22, he said, uh, uh, Then Paul stood in the midst of, of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription um, the to the unknown God, who therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. Yeah. Now this was a society that had many gods. Yes. And Paul took advantage of the situation and he saw this thing and said to the unknown God. And he thought, well I'll just take this, this, this unknown God and I'll, and I'll tell them about the true God. But he said that they were very ignorantly worshiping these other gods. Yeah. Yeah. And that is, uh, that is an example of the people that sat in darkness. Yes, that's right. They spent their whole lives worshiping false gods and never saw the light, but Paul spoke of Christ unto them. But I want you to notice the Bible said that their ignorance was darkness unto them. Yeah. And then the Bible talks about darkness in the sense of oppression or captivity. Yes. Timothy talks about those who are in the snare of the devil and they're taken captive to his will. Now I want you to notice that the scripture says that those that sat in the region of darkness, light has sprung up. Yes. If we have to be honest, or if we will be honest, we'll know that spiritual darkness is on all sides. Yes. Right. Years ago I was listening to a secular talk show station. And it was a secular host that had a woman on there, a woman on there that had written a book, and her name was Rivka Berry. Rivka Berry was stuck in a religious system that was very oppressive. She followed the rules of Islam. She grew up in a devout Muslim household, but she said that she never felt a connection with God. Yeah. For her, because of the indoctrination that she had received, God was angry, God was distant, and... She had no concept of a God that would sacrifice His own Son for our sakes. Right. In every sense of the word, wherever she would look for light, in the world she saw darkness. Yeah. Right. When she would go to her place of worship, she saw darkness. And she was ignorant of Christ and under the oppressive thumb of a religion that could not offer life. Right. And the story is not unique. There are billions in the world today that are in this oppressive religious system. That's right. And then the Bible talks about spiritual darkness. There are those, first of all, that know of Christ, but they are in spiritual darkness. Just think, just think for a few minutes of your own testimony before you got saved. Uh, some of us came from ignorance in this respect. I don't think there's anyone in here today that did not know something about the name of Christ. Right. Now, you may have been Catholic. You may have come from some other nominal religion. I don't know. Uh, you, you, may have, you may have been raised in some type of an evangelical church, but, but there was a time when Christ was not the absolute light of your life. Yeah. Perhaps He was a person that was represented by an ornament on the wall. Or maybe He was just someone that you imagine when you look at the paintings of Jesus. And, or, 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 or maybe just some distant idea of something that you saw in some film or some movie. We knew of Christ, but we were ignorant of how to have a relationship with Him. Amen. Yeah. We knew of Him, yeah. but we did not know Him by experience as the one who could save and offer life. That's and right. perhaps we searched in, in, in religion or didn't search at all. Yes. Perhaps we made Him in our own, uh, according to our own idea. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. There's a lot of people that say they believe in Christ, but He's not the Christ of the Bible. That's right, yeah. We can talk about the cults. Mm -hmm. They don't have the Jesus of the Bible. No. But in our minds, neither was the Christ that we believed in, the Jesus of the Bible, right. until we came to the light. Amen. Yes, that's right. And then lastly, there's a, there's a worldwide darkness. Yeah. This is the condition of society. The Bible says the whole world lies in wickedness. And, yes. and I was, uh, when I first started learning Spanish, I don't, I, I'm not an original language guy at all. Okay, people tell me this is what it means in the original, and I, I don't know if it does or not. But when I was learning Spanish, the word that they use for lies, lies and wickedness, is the same word that they would speak of as a 
cadaver that lies in the graveyard. In other words, it's a condition that uh, the person that's dead can't change. Mm -hmm. They're in the graveyard. The whole world lies in wickedness. And it says the world is taken captive by the devil in his will. And we know that this is a big thing. There's so much interest in the day that we live in of witchcraft and the occult. Yeah. Everybody talks about how spiritual they are. And they are spiritual, but not in the sense that they are that, that, that they have life. You understand what I'm saying? They, they worship the earth. Uh, they live uh, for, for the physical or, or sexual pleasure. And their mentality does not include God. But the whole world lies in darkness. And they have no concept of God unless he shows them the light. Amen. Yes, that's right. Now the world today... Is not much different than the world of Jesus. Yeah. You say, well, the man's more wicked today than he ever has been. I don't really know that that's true. The difference is today we have media. Yeah. Uh, today there's a lot more technology. because of that, a lot of the technology. You can see a lot more than you yes. could see years ago. I, I heard of an old woman who once said the things you do on the front porch, we get on the back porch. But they did the same things. Yeah. Um, the world is in darkness today, just as it was in the time of Jesus. But the Bible says to this dark world, to those that sat in darkness, to those that are found in the condition of ignorance, oppression, and captivity, light has sprung up. Right. Now in these few words, we see the purpose of the love of God. John the Baptist spoke to us of the true light that lighteth unto every man that came into the world. First of all, the good news is to those that are in darkness, to those that are under oppression, to those that are uh, uh, in, in ignorance. The Bible says that God is conscious of the condition of man, and God loves man so much that He provided a way of escape, a way of escape. But 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 let me ask you a question. We know what darkness is speaking of, but when the Bible speaks light, what is it speaking of there? Yeah. yeah. The obvious answer is Christ. That's right. The Bible says in Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Amen. Yes. And the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Yeah. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness. But why would the Bible refer to Jesus as light? Mm -hmm. well, let's take a few minutes to talk about light. Right. Light speaks of Revelation. In the natural, light reveals things that we cannot see in darkness. Spiritual light reveals what we would not see otherwise. And what is it that Jesus reveals to us? Jesus reveals to us, first of all, the person of the Father. Do we want to know what God is like? We all need to look at Jesus. Yeah. You know, I'm amazed sometimes uh, people would talk about... Uh, the love of Jesus and the love of God. And they'll talk about the God of the Old Testament as if he's some different God than the God of the New Testament. Yeah. But it's the same God. Yeah. But Jesus reveals to us the character of God. Timothy tells us the greatest mystery of God in us. God was manifested in the flesh, made known in the flesh, yeah. justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached on in the world, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Yes. But he says, great is the mystery of godliness. Yes. Now, what does that word mystery really mean? Well, in the Bible sense, mystery is something that is unknown, mm -hmm. yeah. but later is revealed. Right. Yeah. Yes. Something that is manifested. There were those that had a glimpse of God in the Old Testament. We can talk about Moses when... When God had showed Moses his hind hinder parts, hinder parts, he had a glimpse of God, but no one had ever seen God in his fullness. Yes. Because God said, no man can see me and live. And then the scripture says that Christ reveals the Father unto us. Yes. God was manifest in the flesh. Amen. See, Jesus wasn't, a, wasn't just a good man. He wasn't just a prophet. Uh-uh. He wasn't just a good teacher. He was all of those things. But he was so much more than that. The Bible says that he was God in the flesh. In all history past, no one ever had a clear picture.
nature of God, but Christ came and revealed God to us. Yes. yes. Jesus was so representative of God that he told Philip, if, you, if you've seen me, he that's seen me has seen the Father. And then secondly, Jesus reveals to us the way to the Father. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come unto the Father but by me. Now I want you to notice something here. No one can come to the Father but by me. Yes, yes that's now, right. Now, there's an implication here that you have to think about to really get. In the Old Testament, when the presence of God was among the people in a tangible way, he was in a place called the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. Brother Smith probably knows a whole lot about the tabernacle. i got a feeling you studied it. If I'm wrong, please correct me. But there was that place called the Holy of Holies. Right. And that Holy of Holies, that, 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 that particular place was separated by a very thick veil. Mm -hmm. The priest, the high priest, could only go in there once a year yeah, yeah. to offer sacrifices for himself and for the people. And as yeah. he went into that place, he had a tassel or a rope tied around his ankle that had a bell on it. And if the bell stopped ringing, they would have to pull him out. Because of his sin, he would be smitten dead in the presence of God. And Jesus comes and reveals the Father unto us. We see the Father's compassion, and we see the Father's love, and we see the Father's concern for mankind. And Jesus goes to the cross to pay the price for our sins. And then the Bible says that that veil was rent from the top to the bottom. It was torn from the top to the bottom, signifying that now he made a way for all of us to get into the presence of God. He is the perfect sacrifice. Yes. That's what he says. That's what he means when he says, I am the way to the Father. Yeah. No one comes to the Father but through me. Yes, In other words, right. your good works, your righteousness, your your intentions, your your whatever you want to say. Yes. Uh, you cannot get to God unless you come through the sacrifice yes. of Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. And Jesus reveals to us the love of the Father. And that he was made man and partook of this evil world. I hear it so often. And you hear it. Well, how could, how could a God of love allow such suffering in the world? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're stuck without an answer. Because I cannot say that I understand. Uh, we, have a, we have a neighbor. Uh, we had a neighbor in Ohio. A um, couple. They were older couple. But not real old. Probably 10, 10, 15 years. 10 years older than me. Not, not real old. But she, uh, she's in a, uh, Kaylee's laughing like, yeah, that's pretty old. <laughs> but she, she, she's in a, she's, she's got some kind of muscular problem where she can't walk very well. And, and he, he has uh, some type of physical disability to where his arm, he can't straight down his arm. His arm is like this. He can only use one arm. And I remember I felt sorry for him when we had a really bad snow and I went over and I, he wasn't home. I thought, I thought, I'll do this when he's not home. I spent two and a half hours shoveling his driveway of snow. The snow was about up to here. If you've ever been up north, it gets pretty bad. Right. Mm -hmm. As soon as I finished, he drove up and I said, man, he saw me. He goes, well, he said, well, neighbor, thank you, but you could have knocked on my door. I got a snowblower in there that you could have used. <laughs> I thought I went to the house and laughed. I don't care. <laughs> but anyway, my wife got a call from this dear lady. And uh, he died this past week. Mm. Had a heart attack and died. Um, and I thought of this woman that cannot take care of herself. And, and these were probably Christian people. Like, I, don't, I don't know. And I thought, I thought how, how, God, why did you let that happen? Why did you take away that woman's means of support? Yeah. Do we not have questions like that? We don't want to yeah, admit it, but that's we do. Right. Yeah. And the sinner comes up and says, if God is the God of love, how, how, how does this... And the only thing that I can go back to say is, is God is not responsible for man's rebellion. Right. Yes, amen. He's not that's responsible. Right. And even in Christian homes, we, we see things like that. And we don't understand why children are born sometimes with the defects that they have. We don't know. But 
But we know that God loved the world so much that He sent Jesus Man. to come and, and rescue us from this, trans, uh, this transitional place yeah. to where when we get to heaven, these things will not exist. And Jesus reveals the love of the Father in that he came to be a man. I heard this illustration. I'm sure you've heard it. They always talk about it around Christmas time on the radio about this lady who wanted her husband to go to the church with her for a Christmas service. And it was around Christmas time. He didn't want to go. So she decides to go on herself. And he hears these, he hears these birds. Um trying to get in his house, trying to come through the window because it's so cold outside. So he suddenly thinks, well, I've got to do something. These birds are going to die. He goes out because they live in a rural area and he opens up the door of his barn and he, he, he lights a fire inside and he's doing everything he can to, to signal the birds to go inside the barn. But he doesn't do anything but startle them. Every time he waves his arms, they, they fly further away. And then he thought, if I could only become a bird, I could show him. And that was when it clicked. That's exactly what Jesus did to bring us into the presence of the Father. We couldn't understand God in, 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 his, in his spiritual form. Yes. We can't right. hear him. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, we, we're limited in what we can perceive. Yes. But Jesus shows us the love of the Father and that He came down and He became a man. And, and think about this, that, 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 that all the pagan people of all of the world have a false concept of God and very few of them believe God is a God of love. Yes. They believe He's a God that has to be appeased, a God that's distant, a God that demands sacrifice is very painful to the people, mm -hmm. a God that... Chooses, you know, you don't, I'm just using a term, you don't know how he's going to wake up in the morning. And a God that is not interested in us, but uses us as pawns or toys. Yeah. But as we look at Jesus, we see the Father who is willing to sacrifice his son for us. Yes, that's right. And some of you can remember the, the first time you experienced the love of God in a tangible way. I told you. I think I told you last week, God had always kept his hand on my heart, but I remember a particular time, and I, don't, I, don't, I, wasn't, I wasn't saved, but I remember a particular time I would go to church with a friend of the family or our cousin, and, and we went to this church of God, and, and I remember the preacher was preaching, and I sat back, and it, I, the, the message wasn't really, I can't remember what he preached, but it had to, it had to connect with me because... He, he said, he said, anybody that wants to touch on God or wants to be saved or whatever it was, come forward. And he was still preaching. The altar call hadn't even really begun. And I ran forward and I was crying. I remember I couldn't understand because I was just, you know, it's one of those real emotional times. And I remember I bumped into the preacher as he's kind of in the middle and I bumped right into him. And I felt just a, a jolt of euphoria go through me like that. And I fell to my knees and I started to cry. And it was God somehow touched my spirit to where it, it affected my body. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Do you understand yes. what I'm saying? Yes, that's right. And then I remember years later, not many years later, but I remember five or six years later when I went to the church and didn't really know how to pray. But I went to the church, decided that I wanted to get saved. And I went to the altar and I said, God, uh, take my life, use it, whatever I told him, I don't remember. But I, I, I remember getting up and I finally felt like that I had peace with God because this God that in my mind uh, had, been, had been distant, this God that had been uh, not really interested. And, it's, and at that point, this, this God uh, left this throne in glory, we're going to say, He came down and He dwelt in my yes. heart and He changed my life. That's yes. right. But before that time, I knew about Jesus. Mm -hmm. But I was ignorant and in darkness because I didn't know about the Jesus of the Bible. Yes. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Yeah. In the world, they have a concept of Jesus. Yes. But it's not the Jesus of the Bible many times. That's why when you, you talk to a Jehovah's Witness that will knock on your door, they're going to tell you everything you believe. But you have to understand 
their terminology means something totally different in their way of thinking. Yeah. To them, Jesus being the Son of God means he's a created being. That's what they believe. Do uh, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yes. But to those that sat in darkness, the Bible says that light has sprung up. And then light shows man his sin. Jesus said men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Yes. yes sir. You know, I, like many of you, I got a Facebook page. Sometimes things will show up on my page and I just can't help but comment. And maybe I've got that argumentative spirit, I don't know. <laughs> but one thing I'm noticing, and I'm not going to apologize for what I'm saying, there's a whole lot of in your face LGBT stuff. Mm -hmm. Whole lot of it. Yeah. And when you comment from a biblical perspective, there is so much backlash. Backlash. And you don't have to say anything hateful or hateful at all. In fact, I don't ever say anything hateful. No. Because I love those people. Yes. But those people are in darkness. Yes. And the darkness is so great that the Jesus they run to or the Jesus they reference say they, they say that he tells them that well 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 God loves you as God made a mistake in the beginning. God didn't make a mistake. No, that's right. He didn't make a mistake. No. Uh uh. And they go so far as to say, well, the science says the science does not say that. No. I'm going to give you a piece of revelation you probably already knew, but maybe nobody has, or has, the, has the boldness to say it. Maybe Pastor Jordan would say it. But these people that transition from a man to a woman or the other way around, they are not women after transition. No. Every bit of their DNA says they are male. Yes. Every bit of their chromosomes say they are male. They yes. are men. Trying to live their life as women, but they are still men. Yes, that's right. You understand what I'm saying? That's right. And brother, how dark we well, were preaching your hate. I am not hating. No. But it's not loving to say, well, you really are. Uh, you, you, God bless you. I'm, I'm so happy for your truth. When you look at these suicide rates and the depression rates that are just the same or greater after transition. Right. That's true. It's not loving to say. Well, you're living your truth. No, it's loving to say, look, you're lost. Yes, that's Amen. right. You're no more lost than somebody else. Yeah. But you need Jesus. Amen. Light is sprung up. But they reject that because Jesus himself said, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil and they will not come to the light. Right. Yeah. That's what they say. Let's continue. When we stand in the light which is Christ, we stand before Him naked. We stand before Him as we are. And we stand before Him with all of our sin exposed. Peter, when Jesus, when he had his introduction to Jesus, Jesus borrowed his boat, remember? Jesus borrowed his boat. And He did that miracle. And Peter said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Right. In the light of Christ's holiness, yes, sir. Peter understood that he was a sinful man, and then finally light conquers darkness. Yeah. Think for a moment about the power of light. When you're in a dark place, and somebody turns on the light, it's not that the light and darkness are struggling to see who can win the battle. But the moment that the light comes on, the darkness has to flee. Yes. That's the power of light. And I thought no matter how dark is the darkness, there's no darkness that can resist light. Yes. None. Good. This young lady, Rifka Berry, in her book, shared the reaction after hearing the gospel for the first time. She said she went to church. I'm sorry, she was in school and there were some Christian people, that, Christian kids that had a little Bible study or prayer club. I, it's been years since I read the book. But she was amazed at how they could, 
how they could talk to God with such comfort. Yes. With such, uh, just as if they knew him. And, and this is what she said. They invited her to go to church. She hid the fact that she was going to church from her father. And she decided to go. And this is what she said. She said the pastor, after finishing his sermon, invited all that wanted to pass in front to pass. To pray. She said, I didn't know what that meant. Pass to the front to pray? But as the people passed forward, I felt a, des a desire to go with them. How wonderful. All that was around me disappeared in one moment. For me, it was a matter of life and death. I had much hunger. Was there life at the altar? My life depended on what I would find there. I determined to find it and nothing would detain me. Nothing would stop me. Everything passed so rapidly. I, I knew that my decision was irrevocable. I was challenging, defying the honor of many generations of my ancestors. But these consequences were not important to me with the possibility that God, the God of the universe, and, and maybe His Son loved me. I entered the aisle, sustained, held up by powerful arms. They were sustaining me, she says. And all of my pain, all of my brokenness, His presence was the only thing that sustained me. Truthfully, I didn't even get to the altar. There in the aisle, I fell on my knees and all of the pain of my life with my family, the abuse, the injustice, the lack of love, the emptiness of my religion, uh, the, uh, everything that controlled my life, uh, it, it changed in my heart. And, and, and I left, he said, and in that moment, I gave it all to God. Said my, my, my shirt was wet down the front with my tears. And as I cried, one of the pastors came up to me and put his hand on me and began to pray. I couldn't hear his words. I barely recognized his presence. I was there left crying and crying until I couldn't cry anymore. Since I breathed very deeply and I saw a cross that was hanging in front of the sanctuary. Said I saw crosses many times in my life over buildings and art and necklaces, but I never knew the significance until now. The cross signified liberty. The cross signified hope. The cross signified pardon. It signified joy. It signified promises that were irrevocable. And overall, every, also, every, everything else, the cross signified something that I never knew before. And that was God's love for me. Yes. Now let me give you a little more information. Her decision was not an easy one. She made this decision to follow Christ. But she didn't tell her family right away. They're Muslims. She had a Bible that she had, had hidden. A little New Testament. And she would read it at night under with a little flashlight. Because in Islam, the penalty for following Christ is death. Her father found the Bible. He wasn't going to kill her. But he wanted to send her back to her home country. And I can't remember which home country it was. I'm thinking it was Iran. But he wanted to send her back to her home country to a Muslim school. She fled. She fled and somehow got some protection. And she's serving God today and has nothing to do with her family. Why would a person renounce their family? Why would a person renounce generations of tradition? Why would a person renounce everything that's in their heritage? Come on. Because she found that Christ loves her. Yeah. 
and she saw the light that expelled the darkness in her life. And although we may not all have testimonies so powerful, we all know of a time when we walked in darkness. Yes, that's right. And in our lives, the light has sprung up. Yes, sir. And then my last point, this will be quick. God has made us light to the world. Right. We can rejoice in what God did in the life of Rivka Berry. We can rejoice in her testimony. We can rejoice in the testimony of what God has done in the lives of others. But we must realize that God has given us as a church the responsibility to share his light. Yes, amen. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. And then he said, a city set on a hill cannot be hid. And, and no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel. That's what he said. Yeah. But on a candlestick. Yeah. And it, it illuminates all that are in the house. We have this great privilege to carry this light to those that are in darkness. I don't know who these people were that this young lady went to school with. I don't remember if the book even tells their names. I don't know who that young teenage boy was that initially shared the gospel with her and invited her to a Bible study. I don't know. His name is Lost in Obscurity. God knows who he is. Yes, that's right. And it was because of the light that he shined that this woman is able to write that book and maybe bring many others in that oppressive Islamic system to the true light of Christ. Yes, amen. And, and we are made lights. And, and you know, the Bible says it, that we, that, that, that we, I, I, I've got it written down here in Spanish, but, but in the book of Philippians, it says that we, we are lights. That's what it says. Yeah. In 2.15, it says that. And you know, I heard a commentary on that verse at one point that really, we shine as lights, that really made it real to me when it talks about the light there. It's talking about a reflected light is the moon. You know the moon has no light in itself. It reflects off the sun and we see it. Right. We are to reflect. The light of Christ. Yes, that's right. As the moon reflects the light of the sun so that the world can see it. What does that mean? That means that we are to share the love of God. We are to preach Christ. I, I'm going to say this, and I don't mean any, I, I'm not attacking anybody. I, I, we, we need to preach Christ, not denomination, yes, not church. Right. No, no, no. Uh, we need to preach Christ because he is the one that sets men free. Yes. yes. And we have that great responsibility. Every one of us has light. The preacher, I'm not, I'm not perfect. Have you ever, have you ever not wanted to share something with somebody because maybe something in your testimony wasn't exactly good at some point? I think all of us have. Try being a preacher that way. Try being a preacher when you get up and say something and your wife knows you, you're guilty of something. But we are not preaching ourselves. You don't have to be perfect to talk about Christ because you're not talking about you. You're talking about someone who is perfect. Yes. Yes. And there's a, there's a great relief in that. You know, I remember when I was in Ohio, I was working... I can't remember exactly the situation, but this guy pushed my button. I, I never get loud with people. Never do. Oh, I know what it was. He called me a liar. I don't like that. Especially if I didn't lie. Mm -hmm. And I got loud with him. How dare you? How dare you call me a liar? How dare you? And you know what he said? He said, I thought you were a church person. You're, you're talking to me like that? You're a church person? And you know what I did? I said, you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah. That was not representative of what I believe, and that was not representative of Christ. Please forgive me. Yeah. And you know, we became somewhat friends after that, and I was able to share with him about Jesus, and he didn't bring all that up all the time. You know why? Because I wasn't talking about me. Right. I was talking about him. 
Yes. You understand what I'm saying? Let the light shine. Yes. Let it shine. You don't know who it's going to shine to. Right. You don't know. Yes. Okay. And well, I don't have the right. You don't need the right words. No. Right. All you need is the unction of God. That's right. When I was in, first got saved, I was uh, I was walking through a park or something, and there's this guy on the swing, and boy, he's just high as a kite. And I felt like the Lord told me to talk to him. I didn't. No, no, no. So anyway, I got to feel a little convicted. And uh, I said, God, I said, if you ever send him by my way again, I'll talk to him. <laughs> well, that next day, I'm somewhere else, and there he is on a bus stop. And I said, how am I going to talk to this guy about Jesus? He's, he's a drug addict. I've never, I've never done drugs. Yeah. I haven't been saved maybe three months. I didn't know anything. <laughs> and I said, how am I going to talk to him about Jesus? He said, ah, I know what I'll do. Hey, I know where you can get some wine. What? Yeah, it's new wine. I remember reading that in the Bible. And his eyes just lit up. He thought I was going to try to sell him drugs or something, you know. And uh, I witnessed to him that way. Now, I don't know if it went anywhere or not. He probably thought I was crazy. <laughs> but the point is, you try to be light. Yeah. You understand? Yes, you try to be light. He's the one that has to change the hearts. We can't do it. Amen. He's the one that has to save. Yeah. But he can't save them if they don't have some information. Right. Yeah. So what is it? The world lies in darkness. Light has sprung up. Jesus is that light. And we have the responsibility to carry that light. Amen. Now, I will close with this. This is my conclusion. You come here every Sunday. This can be a soul-saving station yes, sir. where people can hear yes. and people can respond to the light. Yes. Bring them out. Tell them, hey, I, I, you know, look, I, I can't give you all the help you need and everything, but I know somebody who can. Bring them out. Yes, that's right. And let God touch their hearts. And let Amen. God save the lost. Let's Amen. pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share this this word today. I I know it's a little strange. I know that it's a, a little unusual, Lord. But let us see, Father, where we are uh, as far as our responsibility in sharing the light. And, and thank you, Lord, for opening up to us, Lord, the revelation of Jesus Christ, Lord. There's no one... Uh, here that, that was not in ignorance at one time, but you through your, your great love wherewith you loved us, Lord, you've, you've met us where we are, and you've given us light. You've given us light. I want to encourage you, if, if, if you feel the need to, or even if you don't, it would be good if you came and just spent some time with the Lord for a few minutes at the altar. Just, just ask God, God, help me be a light. God help me help me be what you want me to be. Help me to help me to serve you and if you